Welcome to the 15th episode of Love in a Time of Krona, where we heard some fascinating stories about the Crandall from Sir de Villiers Craft and Charles Hopkins. Gavin mentioned getting de Villiers on, on, onto this, and I thought that's amazing because I've always loved the, the de Crandall wines, and I love history and I love stories. So, Gav, I mean, how do you know de Villiers and, and how did that all happen? So, um, hi everyone, hi Dev, uh, hi Harry. Hello, Charles. Um, so, I actually met De Villiers, um, sure, I don't even know how many years ago. I think it was through Ryan Falkenberg and, and Grant Trollope. Uh, and uh, they're good mates uh, uh, with, uh, with Div. And um, when we started our oyster bar about three and a half years ago, um, we were looking for a wine partner. And I was chatting to Grant Trollope and he said, sure, why? You, you better not forget about uh, De Villiers. So uh, I made a call, chatted to De Villiers. Uh, we uh, obviously have fallen in love with uh, his wine farm, the restaurant, all the wines. Uh, we've been there many times uh, for special dinners. I wish we, we did it more often. Um, but uh, they've been fantastic to us and he's uh, it's been a great partner. and. Uh, I thought it would be a really cool one to have on this forum because uh, there's such a great history and I think the stories um, uh, are going to be great. Oh, it's great to have you here, Div. And uh, I know Charles is here as well. Um, and yeah, I'm, I've just, uh, hi, Charles. I've just unmuted you as well. You're talking about wine from the Durbanville region. And just quickly before um, and we hear all these brilliant stories, Durbanville is the same distance from Cape Town as Constantia. And it's, it was always a stopover point for the travelers. And before it was called Durbanville, it was called Pampun Kral, <laughs> uh, Pumpkin Kral, for the travelers and for those people, I guess, traveling from Cape Town to Stellenbosch. Sometime uh, after this name, the village was renamed Durban after one of the governors, Sir Benjamin Durban. And because of the growth of Durban as a port, that was confusing a change to Durbanville. Charles and I are both new to this kind of technology. This is definitely our first live tasting um, using, using Zoom. Um, so um, I'd like to spring into um, a little bit of history about the Grendel. So I'm the um, fourth generation of my family to own and, and live on the Grendel. And it's... Um, and it's a, and there are lots of and I was brought up, um, you know, as a young person, young chap, um, with my family, particularly my grandfather and my father, um, telling stories around the dining room table, often over a glass of wine, um, and these stories were fascinating. At that stage, um, we, we weren't wine producers, but when we became wine producers, it just became part and parcel of our. Of our story and our and our and our and our culture and who we are. Um, so to go back in history, um, my great grandfather, um, whose name was David Croft, he was born in 1859 in the uh, little town of Villiersdorf um, in the Overberg. Um, his parents um, were a gentleman by the name of Peter Hendrik de Villiers, and his mother's name was Annie. Um, and he's sorry, his daughter's name was Annie. And Peter Hendrick um, had some, he was the founder of the town of Belisdorf, and he had some carpentry work uh, required on, the, on his farm. It was the farm Rundane, which is just out on the Worcester side of the town of Belisdorf. If you turn left after Belisdorf towards high noon, it's a, it's a little uh, farm on the left. Um, it's now owned by the Derue family, who we happen to be good friends with. Um, anyway, um, Peter Hendrick called for a carpenter from Cape Town and a gentleman by the name of Norbertus Graf arrived from Cape Town um, and he was a carpenter and he did some carpentry work and as luck would have it, he fell in love with Peter Hendrick's daughter, Annie, Annie de Villiers. And uh, Peter Hendrick wasn't very happy with this relationship because uh, Norbertus, um, grab the dog, you can. Well, Bertus was a, a lowly carpenter, a so-called knech, and he didn't want his uh, daughter marrying um, this, uh, so, you know, knech. Anyway, they had, 
had a relationship in secret and wrote each other love letters and eventually um, Nook Badger said to Annie, wrote her a letter and said, listen, I'm leaving. I finished the work. I'm tired of your father's uh, attitude towards our relationship. Uh, and he said to quote in the letter, um, I'll meet you at the bottom of the garden at two o'clock on the such and such a day. And if you're there, you come with me back to Cape Town. If not, I'm leaving on my own. And that's, that'll be the end of our romance. Anyway, fortunately for him, he, she met him at the bottom of the garden um, at the required time. And off they went, ended up in Stellenbosch, got married. And two days later, uh, Peter Hendrick de Villiers arrived on his horse. By then, the marriage had been consummated. There was nothing more he could do about the relationship. So he came to an arrangement with his new son-in-law, being that he said to his son-in-law, I'll accept you into the family, but as long as you keep the name de Villiers um, in the names of your offspring. To which Norberta said uh, he would agree as long as his daughter, he said, as long as your daughter inherits equity to your, to your sons, to which Nor to which um, Peter Hendrick agreed. And they came to an arrangement and um, they moved back to the Leesdorp and Annie and North Bartis lived on a farm opposite Radain, a place called Borpis Kloof. And there they produced nine children. And the fifth child uh, was my great grandfather. And sorry, the story gets a bit long, but it's, it gets more interesting. Um, he, uh, so the fifth child was my uh, great grandfather, David. And in those days, they had no formal schools in, in the town of Belizedorp. Uh, there was a, a priest that would come, a Dumini that would come around once a month to give church on a Sunday. And then after church, he would then teach the town kids to read and write. And after some time, um, he said to um, Annie and Norbertus that he reckoned, he, think, he thought that David had some potential and should be sent to Cape Town to get a formal education. So David, at the age of 12, was sent to Cape Town and um, he ended up working by day as an apprentice, as an, an apprentice for his uncle who owned a butchery, uh, a chap by the name of um, Mr. Combrook, Combrink, Arnoldus Combrink. And at night he went to school and so he did night classes to get his education. And by the time he was 18, um, Arnoldus passed away without any direct heirs. And my great grandfather ended up inheriting the small butcher shop. And as things progressed, um, he had an acquiring mind and he grew this butchery into a multinational meat supply business. And his claim, his, the secret to his success really was by was introducing refrigeration to the business, a simple technology, but very modern in those days. And, uh, and he put refrigeration into railway carriages. So he was able to transport fresh meat all around South Africa. Um, and um, he won various meat supply contracts, including to supply the British forces at the outbreak of the uh, Boer War. Uh, he was also uh, a Boer sympathizer on the quiet, but couldn't, that's Red Day in the picture, uh, in the Lijdor. Um He was a Boer sympathizer, so he, he also supported the, the Boer women and children in the concentration camps, supplying them with meat. Um, and then you may ask, well, where does De Grenel come into the story? So he liked to travel widely. Um, in fact, the refrigeration technology came from Australia. Um, but he also went on a trip to Argentina to source some cattle for his uh, meat business. And there he fell in love with a, a string of Arab horses. Um, and instead of bringing cattle back to South Africa, he brought back this uh, group of Arab horses. Uh, which he um, stabled um, at, in Fernwood in Newlands in Cape Town, which, as we all know, gets over four and a half thousand millimetres of rainfall a year. Very wet. I think it's one of the wettest places in the country. Um, and the horses started developing the croup and foot rot. And his vet, vet then said to um, David, listen, I think you should move the horses to a drier area. And they're not suited to being stabled under the mountain. And at the time... Um, Musenberg Farm was in the market. David, or my great grandfather, lived in Seapoint. He used to travel into town to his business. Um, and Musenberg Farm was in the market. So he um, got on his horse, and this was now before the motor car, obviously, and he rode to Musenberg, took him half a day to get there. And when he arrived in Musenberg, uh, the beach was full of rotting kelp and blue bottles. And he said, No, this, 
this place is not for him. It's only in the market for something like 50 pounds. But nevertheless, he said, no, this is not a place for him. And then he turned his horse northwards uh, to De Grendel, which was also in the market. Um, and De Grendel has an average rainfall of around 400 millimeters of rain, so a whole lot less. And he bought the farm, and I don't know what he paid, but he bought the farm. And the first thing he did was uh, build some um, stables for the horses. And Harry, I think there's a picture somewhere um, on your slides of the okay. of the Kutsais, um, I think sort of looking down towards Cape Town, somewhere like the second or third or fourth picture there. If you can find the view from the farm, it shows the Kutsais in the distance. But in any event, um, that's where that he um, kept the carriages and and also stable the horses. Um, it's also just above the Kutsais is a, vin a Sauvignon Blanc vineyard um, that we use to name our quite well-known uh, Kutsais Sauvignon Blanc after, which is sort of um, in the more greener style of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and um, so we use two, two variants of Sauvignon Blanc, it's sort of a more tropical style, which is our bigger blend, but then we also do a, a smaller batch of uh, more pyrazine, greener style Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, so that's how the, 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 the farm came into the family. Um, and wow. some years later, my great-grandfather then built himself a house on the farm, um, wow. a two gable building. And there's a picture of that as well, somewhere there, Harry. Yeah, I'm just on, kidding, the, on this, there we go. So that, that is the house my great-grandfather built. Um, so the farm was built, bought around 1890, 1890, 1880, built, built the house, uh, it was a gentleman's retreat, and um, he used to come out to the farm at weekends, um, so uh, on, on horseback. Everyone loves a love story, um, and everyone's got to deal with the father. De Villiers, is, is that your house now? Is that where you're yes. living? That's where I and I live. So I'm the fourth generation of my family to be living in that house. Um, my grandfather and my father um, were before me, preceded me. Um, and as what's interesting is, is that the house is that stage near two gables. Um, and then later on, when my great grandfather got the right of that, so the house is is quite you know quite large. It was, it was the architect was. Um, it was Herbert Baker's offices, but it wasn't Herbert Baker himself. It was a, um, his partner's called Kendall Morris that um, actually designed the house. Um, so De Grenel means the, uh, the latch or the opening mechanism in Dutch. Um, and it was called that because, as you mentioned in your introduction, Harry, uh, the Dumble area was really kind of a halfway house or a stopping off place for replenishment of horses of, for the pioneers moving inland um, out of Cape Town. Um, and so the farm is situated on the Tigerberg Hill and the, it, it offered a beacon for the trekkers leaving Cape Town um, to direct themselves out of, the, out of the city. But it also offered them hard ground um, for their ox wagons to travel over because the hill and the size of the hill offered hard ground compared to the soft sands of the Cape Flats. And that's probably also why the N1 is situated where it is, so close to the the outskirts of the Tigerberg Hill. So it was the, it was the Hrendel or the opening mechanism to the, to the inland. Um, so that, that's where the, where the name came from. Um, so interestingly, the, the Tigerberg Hill, um, or the Teigerberg, um, got its name. Um, yeah, so that photograph that you chaps could see um, is, is from the Tigerberg Hill from the farm looking back towards Cape Town. Uh, you can see the Atlantic Ocean um, off to your right. We got, we're about seven kilometers from the, from the sea. Um, and we've got 180 degree views of, of Cape Town and the Atlantic Ocean, uh, both to the right and to the left. False Bay obviously being on the left hand side on a clear day as we've been having, experiencing now, um, you know, you can see the ocean and all the way to Cape Point in fact. It's a bit smoggy on this particular day, but these last couple of days it's been amazingly clear. I think it's the time of year and the fact that people aren't smoking as much, probably. <laughs> that's, and, that's, that's uh, and then you that's... can see the cellar at, at the bottom left. Um, and you can use your mouse, Harry. I think you've got. Yeah. Yeah. Can you Harry, see? I think you've got the mouse there. Yeah, that's the cellar there. Okay. And then the Kutsais is that white building um, below the vineyard, Harry. 
Yeah, that's the Kutsais. I think there might be a better picture of it somewhere. And um, the stables is a thatch roof building. And the was vineyard just above was, it. Um, was that house named after the Sauvignon Blanc? That, no, the, yeah, after the Sauvignon Blanc. The vineyard, the vineyard just above, the, above that building is also called Kutsais, after the, named after the building. Um, and that's where the, the first grapes for the um, pyrazine driven Sauvignon Blanc comes from. Cool. Um, yeah, so I mean, we've got fantastic views and lovely cool breezes coming, uh, you know, onto um, an altitude of around 150 meters to 200 meters above sea level. So we get lovely cool breezes coming off the Atlantic Ocean from, from both sides. Um, 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 the Villiers, tell So it's a very good area for, but Charles will tell you a bit more about the terroir. Um, but I can just maybe just go on, Harry, um, yeah. as far as the stories are concerned, because a lot of people ask. You know where the where do, where does the title come from? Um, um, and you know it's quite a a rarity, uh, particularly in this day and age, particularly in South Africa. Um, and it's a baronetcy um, title that was granted to my great grandfather uh, or bestowed upon my great grandfather, which is a, a hereditary title. Um, and it's one, by ranking, it's one notch above a knighthood, which is only for one's life time that you have a knighthood. But a baronetcy has the same address of Sir, but it is carried over from one generation to the next as long as there is a, an, an oldest um, son or relation. But the story goes um, that my great grandfather was successful in business and, and sort of in, the, in the 1890s also becoming involved in, in civic life. And he became, he was a, um, on the town council of Cape Town and became mayor of Cape Town 1890 to 1892. He was responsible for uh, introducing electrification to, the, to Cape Town and the sewerage works. Um, in fact, the old, there's still the electrical works that are named after him, uh, situated next to the Maltino Dam um, at, in the gardens. Um, so my great grandfather, then in around 19, well in 1910, also became a cabinet minister in Louis Buerta's cabinet. So I mentioned he was a, a Boer sympathizer, and he and Louis Buerta were great friends. And in fact, Louis Buerta often used to stay at De Grenel when he came to Cape Town. Um, and um, in 1910, he was still a bachelor in his early 50s, and the was two the cabinet to decide who would get them. And they discussed this at cabinet level and initially decided not to accept them because they wanted to be independent of Britain. But then at the same time, they also didn't want to snub the British. So they came up with a compromise and they decided to give these three baronet titles to three prominent South Africans um, at the time who were bachelor, who, who are bachelor, who would be bachelors. Um, and they would then inevitably die with the title and that would be the end of that. And there was a governor Natal that they found who ended up being gay. He never got married and a chap in some mayor in a small town in the free state. And then they said to my great grandfather, and you, David, you 52, you're not gonna get married ever. You're a confirmed bachelor. Why don't you take one of the titles? And he was persuaded to do so. And then promptly in 1912, decided to get married to get married and he married this young lady in the photograph, um, Eileen van Heerden, and she was the daughter of the Dumini of the Grutekerk in Cape Town. And the Dumini and my great-grandfather were great friends and I think it was kind of an arranged marriage. And she was 22, so more than half um, his age. Um, and they ended up being very happily married and moved back to the Grendel after they got married and in 1913, the little boy in the, in the photograph is my grandfather. Uh, he was born, and that's, that is um, de Villiers, who, um, keeping with, with, the, with the arrangement that was made between um, Lord Batters and his father-in-law, Peter Henrik de Villiers, um, the name de Villiers was kept, uh, should produced, had the name de Villiers in it. Uh, it just so happened that my grand grandfather um, was meant to be named after his father, i.e. David, but the Domini forgot the David and just called him de Villiers. Um, so, and that's who I was named after. So, um, 
yeah, so that's the, the story of the baronetcy and um, my father inherited the title of, or my grandfather inherited the title after his father died. Uh, he was only 16 um, at the time, so a young, young chap. That's the house now with the three gables. So uh, my great-grandmother was an avid, uh, keen, very keen gardener and designed the garden based on the English country garden style. Um, and it's been kept going for four generations. Um, and we often have um, garden groups come and visit the garden we have had in the past. Um, and I'm sure, hopefully, I'm sure we will do so again in the future. Um, so, so um, yeah. So did, uh, were the Brits quite uh, irritated with your, that the, now that it's been handed down and <laughs> with the four, four genera five generations? No, I'm sure the Brits were happy, but the, the Brits, I, th I don't think, minded, but I think it was the, the, certainly the Afrikaners in, in the cabinet that right. weren't that happy. Right. Yeah. Are we in the dining room? Yeah. And I just want to show you in front of the fireplace. Okay. Hello, Charles. Um, there's a, a fire screen. And it's a brass, it's, it's a yes. brass uh, fire screen. And I don't know if you can recognize the heraldry on that screen. Harry, you thought I you might know where it came from. I, I, well, I, I mean, I know that, I know our emblem, the Malk emblem, and it was Prussian or German and looks very similar to that, but ours looks like a, a plucked chicken, which is about to get cooked, and yours looks like a feathered, like, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so you. that's, you 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 you're warm. It actually ca it came from German from Germany, and it's the um, the emblem of the the Kaiser of of um, Germany, and it was um, taken from a a German locomotive in Windhoek, um, and sent to my great grandfather as a gift from Louis Boerter, um for supplying him the horse to lead the campaign to invade. German Southwest Africa at the outbreak of the First World War wow. in 1914. Um, so my grandfather gave him a horse from the Rendel with which to lead his campaign. And I think he's the only um, prime minister in history to ever let, let his own forces uh, to war, into battle. Wow. Um, so that's... Um, Harry, another interesting story in the dining room, I can, you can see behind me is uh, an amour. Um, yeah. And this was... Um, when my great grandfather built the Frendel as a bachelor, he had no no furniture, as most young men don't. And so he asked a friend of his to find some furniture for him. Um, he was a, uh, an antique dealer, and this friend of his went to an auction in Stellenbosch, and he bought this amour at the, at the auction, and it was brought back to the Frendel. And um, some days later, they were sitting at the dining room table. As they used to, this is the dining room table, telling stories, and for some reason they looked at the armoire and they, they started fiddling with it and discovered that there was actually a secret um, compartment in the one leg, which I'm going to open as you can see. You can see in the leg is this, oh, wow. um, it's got drawers in the, in, the, in the leg, and in the one drawer they found a set of uh, false teeth. Good. And in the other drawer, they actually discovered the, the love letters written between my between my great great grandfather's parents, Annie and Norbertus. And it so turned out that this amour used to be in the de Villiers family, and obviously been handed down to Norbertus and Annie. And they'd hidden their love letters in there from their romance. And they must have fallen on hard times uh, and sold the amour. Um, and just by luck, it came back into the family. Um, that's amazing. Yeah, so that's, that's also <laughs> an interesting um, anecdotal story. There's a photograph taken of my great-grandfather, the gentleman in the top hat on the left. And I so, so happened to have the hat, which I'm now putting on my head. I don't know if everyone can see that. <laughs> it is meant to be heritage, um, the theme of, to, of today's meeting. And then Smuts in the middle, Field Marshal Smuts, and Louis Boerter on the far right, who was then uh, Prime Minister of South Africa. 
And this was the delegation that was sent to Versailles after the First World War to sign the peace treaty with Germany. And as we all know, have done history, this peace treaty was very um, unfair towards Germany and imposed huge reparations that Germany had to pay uh, the European um, allies as by way of compensation uh, for the war and the losses that were, were caused. In any event, the South Africans were very anti-signing this, this treaty. They felt it was very unfair. And in fact, it was Smuts who predicted it would probably lead to another, another war, which, which indeed it did. And, they, mm -hmm. and my great-grandmother also um, was, on, was with them on this trip. And the story goes, has handed down um, from one generation to the next. Um, Smuts took my great-grandmother, um, Eileen, through a, um, for a drive into the French countryside just before signing the treaty the day before. And um, they drove past a graveyard, a war graveyard, with these thousands and thousands of gravestones of both fallen Allied and German soldiers. And he quite liked the ladies, and Smuts put his hand, and I think he was quite fond of my grandmother, great-grandmother, and he put his hand on my great-grandmother's knee and said to her, and I won't try and emulate because he had a, the accent, because he had a mom's bray, so I won't try and emulate the, the, the accent, but he said to her in high, de in high Dutch, he said, tomorrow, my dear, I sign away the future of the next generation. Um, and of course, the South Africans were, were very against the signing of the treaty, treaty. But as the junior partner uh, of the Allies, they had little yeah. say, and they were forced to comply and sign with everyone else. Um, and as it turns out, Smuts was correct. And indeed, those reparations imposed on the Germans did lead to another war. And before I introduce Charles, um, again, we've had someone we've had we've had people who are stalwarts in the industry, and and Charles is one of these. He's been giving a beautiful series on the Prendel wines on uh, Zoom meetings, um, but I think he's been making wine for over thirty years, which is, that, I mean, that's enough said. Um, worked for Graham Beck before. Um, and, I think before your father um, Div, uh, brought him on to even develop the wine cellar, but um, lots of wine awards, was at Elsenburg College, um, and then done a lot of traveling around from South America to California, to France, to Spain, to learn his trade. Big advocate of continuous learning in terms of himself. But the thing that I like the most is, um, you know, not only being on the board of the Cape Winemakers Guild, but one of the guys that has mentored more people, more students or future winemakers through the Cape Winemakers Guild protégés than any other guild member. So very much about giving back and, and education. So I'm gonna leave it at that, but Charles, hi, welcome. Great to have you on. Thank you, Harry. Thanks, hello, WS, hello, friends. It's great to, to chat to you, um, <laughs> yeah, I think. I can summarize the whole history of, of uh, De Villiers, what he just mentioned. And funny enough, Harry, I'm drinking the same wine as you, Winifred, and I'll tell the story about Winifred later on. But uh, uh, not to compliment De Villiers, we, uh, he's my boss. But, um, you know, I was a young boy brought up, uh, I'm one of the misleading South Africans with a name like Henry Charles Hopkins, and I'm a boy from Bredasdorp in the Southern Cape. And, um, my dad used to told me when I was a young boy, Charles is a gentleman, a gentleman in South African politics. I said, Dad, what, what is a gentleman and what is South African politics? <laughs> and he was referring to Sir de Villiers Graaf. And uh, I'm telling you today, if there's a gene in your makeup that make you a gentleman, it's running through this Graaf family. And de Villiers is a classic example. His dad that appointed me was a a gentleman and he's a gentleman unfortunately i never met his his uh, granddad uh sir de villiers Graf. but anyway let's leave that behind um, i'm privileged to be involved with the seller from the beginning so i designed a portion of the of the production seller myself uh, and we started in 2004 i was the winemaker at rain beck and we uh, purchased grapes from the grendel and i quickly realized there's something really special there and uh uh, the Villiers' dad, Sir David, told me, Charles, I'm planning to build a cellar. Are you keen to get involved? And I told him, of course. And uh, 
I design a winery myself, and if there's any hiccups and shortfalls, I'm the guilty party because I, uh, uh, I design the winery at the back, and we harvest 700 tons. And guys, there's, there's uh, 546 wineries in South Africa, and there's 900 and I think 80 winemakers, give and take, uh, changing from year to year. And um, some of them purchase from their own vineyards. It's called a terroir winemaker, and some purchase from other vineyards. So I'm pr pr privileged to be part of that. So um, we have a 700 tons of which 70% is from the farm and 30% is from purchase vineyards. And um, yeah, if you can't find the, the quality from the farm or the specific style you're looking for, uh, you buy it from other vineyards. And uh, when I arrive on the farm, I told Sir David, I want to bring five vineyards, guys, not great road, but five vineyards with me. And he looked at me and said, Charles, it's fine, go for it. And I bought five vineyards with me. And um, yeah, and uh, today some of our wines is wonderful region, Durbanville or Cape Town. And some of it is coastal region and some of it is Cirrus. And even one wine that's um, Western Cape, that's from a bigger region. But Harry, it's, it's a fascinating farm, farm to work for and a fascinating family. It's, uh, they support you and it's so tough in this uh, telling times and challenging times. But uh, Wow, what a what an amazing place, and uh, I'm so proud and uh, so happy about uh, what our wines achieved in the last uh, 15 years, if I if I can use amazing. that term. And, uh, and you know, uh, you mentioned about getting involved with younger winemakers. I think one thing is to produce a wine and say, wow, you know, put some accolades on it, and it's special. But one thing is to get involved with a young winemaker and um, with the support of De Villiers and his family to say, let's put our energy and our sort of trust in the young person and say, listen here, we trust you. We want to take you forward. And to see these young kids uh, progressing in the industry and becoming winemakers at Durbanville Hills and at KWV and at Estelle and at Flagstone and at Duncan Savage. And it, it's just mind blowing. It's just mind blowing to see a young rookie kid arriving from Steinkopf and Pineal and uh, Uppington and, you know, um, two, three years later, you know what it means to me. They phone me back and say, Charles, I've been appointed as a winemaker at one of these wineries. And I say, I, I trust you from the beginning. I trust you and I, I trust your abilities. And that is just mind blowing. And we had, Charles, we had Duncan Savage do a session with us. So everyone... No, I think the women know him. They were like all a little bit gooey eyed over him. And I, I don't understand it because I've, I've done 15 yeah. sessions and I didn't get any. So I'm mm. like trying hard. But I'm, I'm a bit, in your, I'm a bit in, your same, in your same position, my friend. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now, now, Charles, tell us about the terroir because you, we saw that picture earlier and you've got the cool breeze. We're talking Sauvignon Blanc. And then just besides that, I saw a picture of. I mean, Ceres, people won't, won't know, but Ceres has got its own sort of appellation or district. And I saw some vines in the snow. Yeah, Harry, it, it's special, you know. Uh, just talking first of the Grenoble, like I think the Valleys mentioned, we're seven kilometers away from the ocean and we're ranging from 180 to 290 meters above sea level. That's a true expression of a cool, moderate climate. But then we are privileged that uh, Valias' uh, uncle, um, Peter Graf, he um, farmed in Cirrus in the Witzenberg, 960 meters above sea level. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, some, sometimes of the winter, the vineyards are covered with snow, not the vineyards itself, but the soil. And it's just mind blowing to think of a South African vineyard growing on continental conditions. Where the you know where the summer where the, uh, there's such a variance between day and night temperature, especially in harvest time. But the, of course, the snow in harvest time, the, uh, in in winter time when the vines are dormant, don't really mean a lot. But it's just it's just mind blowing to think of a vineyard covered with snow. The soil is covered with snow in South Africa, and we grow Pinot Noir and uh, Chardonnay there, and the Valleys' brother. Uh, Robert, just uh, about 20 kilometers onwards in the town, just, just on the outskirts of the town, Opiberg, plant some Shiraz. And in the near future, we will launch uh, Opiberg Shiraz. That's really something special. 
something peppery. And I, uh, I don't know if your friends are, uh, that's watching this is, no, is, is aware of that pepperiness that the French call rotundan is one of the most sought after uh, aromatics in wine, in Shiraz specific. And, uh, you know, this vineyard is show, showing wonderful signs of uh, rotundan or black pepper. We've, we've had some sessions about Shiraz or Syrah, and um, it's my favorite. It's nearly al almost always my favorite. Um, and interestingly, you mentioned Robert, because this goes back a couple of years where when the whole drone industry was starting off, um, I've invested in a drone business. And um, Ian, uh, a friend of mine, uh, went and mapped up the apples of Robert's apples. Um, and it was all in the beginning, so it was all new how you do the NDVI and you start mapping. So I know exactly where that is, and it's beautiful there. Mm. It's amazing. Yeah. No, and, and one, one of the great things about South Africa, you know, we are not the Napa Valley or Bordeaux, where the valley is the same more or less from the, from the bottom to the top. We are living in a country where there's geographic contrast. And uh, the Graf family allow me to... Uh, exploit this, if I may use this word, um, by buying grapes from amazing areas like Lutzville and the Cirrus Plateau that I just mentioned. I put up grapes from from Ilum, where I uh, I'm originally from Redasdorp, and uh, Ilum is very close to my heart. And uh, this afternoon, my myself and a friend here. I don't know if I must allow to mention a friend that visited me. Of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, last year we achieved. Uh, a platter five star with our 17 magnum Ilum Shiraz and it's peppery, you know, and it's it's special, it's it's amazing. And it seems to me the vineyards that Robert and the Villiers uh, uh, sort of motivate me to plant on Rietfontein, Robert's farm just on the other side of the, of the small village called Oppiberg, uh, it, it has the potential to produce this peppery flavor. That's really special. Well, that's amazing. So let's um, let's can we let's just talk about three wines. Um, you've got your flagship, the Rubiette, and I like that story um, because of what a Rubiette is. And maybe you can tell us that. Yeah, Rubiette is a true Bordeaux uh, blend of uh, Cabernet dominant from Somerset West that the crafts own the farm now, and then Petit Verdot. I think it's one of the most underrated red varieties in South Africa, uh, and rounded off with a dash of Merlot and a dash of Cabernet Franc. So Rubiat is, I remember like yesterday, I was between the barrels and uh, David, the village's late dad, asked me, Charles, can you produce sort of a special wine? And, um, and I say, uh, David, one of our shortfalls on the farm is we don't have an old Upas vineyard, you know, a very special old vineyard. But uh, I can source the fruit for you in Somerset West that I've been exposed in my Grand Beck days and I bought some grapes. He allowed me to bought some grapes. And uh, the Cabernet is older than 35 years. Guys, the very some vintages weigh that more, le sorry, less than a gram. So the, for, for those who, that don't know every, every day that's been exposed to wine, a berry that's so small is so concentrated. There's so much tannin and so much longevity and structure in it. And I purchased that and uh, it's the base of our blend Rubiat. And Rubiat means, of course, the love poems of Omar Kayan. Uh, and um, yeah, every, every year we, uh, with every vintage change, we put a different uh, poem on the bottle. And uh, it's a four line love poem and the Villiers have the privilege to select the, the, um, the Rubiat, the specific uh, poem that we want to put on the bottle there. Yeah, there he's showing it to us, and it's amazing. It's, it's so fascinating to talk to a group, uh, uh, Harry, of your friends and uh, friends of ours that support us in, in this telling times. And I'm sitting here at home in Paul and chatting to you, and we can have a live conversation about uh, labels and wines, and it's just a pity we can't be together. And, hug one another and uh, say we love one another. It's such a pity. Did you say why, why, why the Rubiette is the poem that you chose? 
Uh, maybe the Villiers can tell you the story, ma'am. Um, but uh, the amazing thing is that uh, he selected a, a poem. It's a bit like the picture on the Mouton Rothschild Beach here that expressed the year and the vintage. I think you're familiar. It's, I see you nod. Um, okay. It's something uh, familiar you familiar you with. But the poem I selected, and one of my colleagues is saying, yeah, that's it, David. The Villiers is that pass away. He selected a poem, and it's expressing the year that he passed away uh, about something, you know, happening in the family and stuff like that. But uh, it's, it's a four line love poem and that's why we use four different varieties. And, uh, but the emphasis is very much on Cabernet and Petit Verdot with rounding of, like I mentioned, of Merlot and Cabernet Franc. Charles, can I pop in here quickly? Um, <clears throat> the Rubiat was, the Rubiat, I don't know if my speaker's on. It is, um, it is. Okay, good. So the Rubiat is a, a a poem uh, written by Omar Khayyam, who was a famous um, Persian poet, mathematician, philosopher, astrologer, who lived in uh, Persia, in Iran, most probably, around the 11th century. And he was my father's um, favorite, favorite poet. Um, obviously, the, the poetry is written um, in Arabic, but it was translated into English uh, by J. Fitzgerald in the 19th century and uh, subsequently has been translated into uh, about another 60 odd languages, including Afrikaans. Um, Langenhoven, apparently in the 20th century, translated the, the, the poems, which are four lined um, quatrains um, into, into Afrikaans. And as Charles mentioned, every vintage we print a different verse of the poem on the, on the, um, on the label. And I think, um, and my father said it, it was his dream to call a wine the Rubia um, because of the four lined uh, poetry at each line in the poem uh, reflecting uh, one of the varietals in the blend. Um, so it's Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and Petit Verdot. Don't you want to read the one that's on that bottle? Well, this actually so happens to be uh, the, fifth, the 2015 vintage. Okay. Uh, it's done incredibly well um, accolade wise. I'm just going to switch on my torch here. I can't see. Um, so it's as much as wine has played the infidel and robbed me of my robe of honor well. I often wonder what the vintners are. One half so precious as the goods they sell. Uh, Harry, maybe I can join, I can add, it, add on what the Vilnius is reading. Uh, 2015, uh, for those of your, of the people that watching this, is, uh, is, is, uh, will be remembered as one of the best vintages, uh, according to the Jan Bolans and the Etienne Lerich and uh, Kevin Arnolds, yeah. as the best vintage ever in South Africa. Now, I want to say that 2017 is very much have the same sort of um, CB, if I might use that word, <laughs> The same characteristics as 2015, and uh, but I'm glad the Villiers is enjoying that because it's a wine with unbelievable uh, shoulders and longevity, and I'm convinced that this wine will only sort of reach its peak in about uh, 2030 or something like that, 10, 15 years from now. Uh, 2015 wines is just spectacular. It's just they have so much longevity. And so much um, length in them, it's, it's just mind-blowing. We always talk about the accessibility of wine. And I've been drinking De Crendel for a long time. First of all, if, I should, if I think about your rosé, it's one of my favorites. Um, and then you've got the Kutzal Sauvignon, but you've also got your, your lifestyle of Sauvignon, which is amazing. You've got a Viognier, you've got Merlot. When you talk about Sauvignon and Merlot, I mean, isn't that what Crendel is all about? And then I believe that uh, you're a big fan of Pinotage, so. Yeah, <laughs> um, Harry, it's, it's, uh, it's not what I'm a fan of. It's what, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's planting a vineyard uh, or uh, inheriting a vineyard and then sort of working with it and make a few viticulture changes and then uh, see how it sort of express itself in a tank in a barrel so it's uh, we are busy with one of the most exciting times i'm privileged to work every day of course not today or yesterday that's been a public holiday but next week i'll work the whole time guys and um, i wish i can i can share it with you putting a young wine in a barrel 
and then uh, racking it after six months and uh, blending the new and the second and the third and the fourth full barrels, <clears> fifth full barrels together and uh, making one small adjustment, maybe one or two small adjustments and then rinsing the barrels and putting it back again. And it's this time of the year that after 12 months we will uh, transfer the wine from barrel and put it in a tank and I must force myself not to taste it as the wine sort of fill up the tank but to wait for a day and just to, to experience the wine have as it's settled and tasted it then it's just unbelievable it's amazing to think back and i'm probably the only person that remember that uh, how the wine went into barrel and how we meticulously uh, sort of um, look at the chemical composition and make sure the wine is tip top when it go into the barrel as a young wine and how the barrel works. So many people think of putting wine in a barrel, it's adding wine, wood flavor, sorry, to it. But it's not true. To put the wine in a barrel is to sort of, uh, in a gentle way, oxidize it and soften it. And yeah, guys, I wish I have two glasses in front of each of you to show you a wine that's a young wine, you know, that remind me of a young kid or a young rugby player and how the wine tastes 12 months later where it's accessible and... Uh, sort of drinkable it's just absolutely mind-blowing even after 34 years it's still a miracle to me still a fairy tale but you can extend that you can extend that story further because just like a wine grows i read somewhere where you look at how the vines grow and so when you start with young vines and how they mature and how they start off a little bit scrappy and a little bit grumpy and then they come into their own and they become mature and and you've gone through that. Yeah, no, it's, 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 uh, you know, Harry, it's to, to plant a vineyard and to make a call what rootstock to use and what sort of bitters for Nebra to use. Are you going for Merlot or Shiraz or Sauvignon Blanc? In our case, I'm convinced the ideal variety is for the, the Crandall farm with our close proximity to the ocean is Sauvignon Blanc and Merlot. To plant that and three years later you get the first crop, it's only 300 grams per vine and over like we say, the vine go through puberty and at year seven, uh, you pick three kilograms per vine. In our case, of course, there's different uh, yields per, per each area in South Africa, but the average yield uh, per vine in, in Durbanville is about three, 3.5 uh, kilograms per vine. And then really you can make a judgment to say, is this successful or not? And uh, you can ask the villiers, we go through meticulous detail to determine what variety and what rootstock to use on specific soils. And it's just mind blowing and it's so satisfying to plant a vineyard and seven years later to, in a sense, reap the benefits of that to say, uh, maybe you called up to a podium and say, oh, you achieved something. That's very special. Uh, when, uh, when the wine do well and, uh, you know, the wine do well in a, in a competition is one thing, but uh, having friends like you have tonight on this screen, enjoying a glass of Merlot and enjoying a glass of Shiraz or Rubiat or Pinot Noir from the Cirrus vineyards is probably one of the most satisfying things in wine. You know, there's a reason why Gav has got De Grendel as its sole supplier. And, and Gav, I mean, am I right? We spoke about it earlier. Just the quality of the wine and you know, you're talking Sauvignon Blanc and oysters and all that. That's that's it's pretty amazing, Harry. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. It works so well for us because uh, it's not an off a standard uh, wine that's uh, been around like a, a Niederberger or Boschendal. This is something special and that we've been able to pair with our oysters. And uh, I can tell you from most of the customers we had at the at the oyster bar have been a lot of foreigners and uh, the guys have absolutely loved and uh, probably the biggest seller for us with our oysters has been the Sauvignon Blanc, obviously the MCC because oysters and champagne, but funny enough, Rosé as well. The Rosé is, is absolutely awesome. Oh, it's amazing. Um, it's priced well um, and uh, the guys love it with our oysters. So yeah, it's been a, a really good uh, uh, fit for us and uh, yeah, it's great to be associated. So, yeah. And, yeah, it's the only one that we, we sell. We only sell the Grendel wine. Harry, can I just add on to the Gavin, thanks, uh, thanks for that. But it's, it's amazing to, um, 
to have people uh, arriving at our farm and you know, attending, uh, you know, visiting our tasting room and just say, listen, we just last yesterday or the day before we had uh, six oysters, so it's so bloody expensive, right? We had six. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking with you. We, we had a few oysters and a glass and a bottle of Rosé uh, and the wine was so cheap but the oysters were so expensive. No, I'm, 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 jo I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking with you. But it's, it's, it's fascinating. This is how the one hand washes the other. Say, uh, how are you scratching my back and I'm scratching yours? Um, people visiting you in the, in the waterfront and enjoying a, a, a tray of oysters with a glass of the Grendel wine and you know, it's not about the Grendel, it's about how the wine industry can actually chip in and help one another. If it's somebody enjoying a steak in Marmersbury or a piece of this or a piece of that, it's just amazing. And uh, I want to thank you for your support. And uh, it's just amazing how people visit our farm and say, can you believe it? Yesterday or the day before, I had some oysters in the, in the waterfront with some of the Grendel wine and now I'm on the farm. So, you know, it's, it is uh, awesome is, you know, with, uh, with having oysters, you don't have, um, nobody sits down and has oysters without wine. So that's why, uh, or with an MCC or something, but uh, certainly at, at our oyster bar, uh, we, we've, the, where it's worked really well with us and De Crendel is we've been able to, we promote as much as we could. We could promote the Crendel. I'm having a glass of Winifred. Winifred is named after the Villiers' mum. She's Sally Winifred Graf, and uh, it's a special blend of, uh, in, in this case, in 2019, the emphasis was on Semillon with Chardonnay and Viognier, and um, all wooded, all put together. It's dry, and um, it's just a great drink, and... Uh, yeah, Gavin, I wish I had a tray of your uh, oysters here tonight that I can enjoy with this Winifred. I think that's the fourth wine you must add to your list. Eh? Harry, yeah. I've got a question, if you don't mind, um, yeah. to De Villiers or Div. Um, what happened to the Arabian horses that came back from South America? Did they survive and have uh, children that are ponies <laughs> that are still on the farm? And secondly, when were the first vines planted on the farm? So the horse has always been part and parcel of De Frendel. Um My grandfather was a, was a keen lover of horses, always rode every Sunday. In fact, I rode a few times, I remember as a kid riding with him. That's when he had actually come out and talk about the, his war stories. Um, so he never really talked about the war unless he, he was with, on the farm with me on horseback. Um, and then uh, my brother Robert uh, breeds Arab horses. And to this day, we've got horses on the farm, which we use for equine therapy. My younger brother, Johnny, started a, um, a foundation um, focused on uh, doing equine therapy with uh, disadvantaged uh, kids, disaffected youth. Um, so it's still very much part and parcel um, of, of De Grendel. Um, and then the, the second question, I can't remember, Harry, to remind me. How, how old are the vines, or when were they first planted? I guess it was in stages, but... Yeah, so the first vines, also an interesting story, we planted, we planted um, in 2000. Um, I, I was, when I was in Stellenbosch, 91 to 93, um, I uh, visited uh, Dame people, Bailey's daughter, uh, Kristen, one day, for had tea with, with her and her folks. And Dampy, um, you know, a legend in the wine industry, said no, to me amazing. that Destel at that time were thinking of, of um, building a winery. And that was the start of the Dimble Hills uh, setup. And he said to me, why don't you look at planting vines on De Grendel? So I went back to De Grendel and said to my dad, you know, how about planting vines? And he said, um, he was living on the farm at this stage. My grandparents were still alive, staying in the main house. Um, and my dad said, well, why don't you dig a few profile holes um, and let's check the soil out, which, we, which I promptly did. And the samples came back very favorably. And then my dad and I went to my grandfather and said, you know, how about planting some vines? And my grandfather said, you know, I love wine. Uh, he used to be a big drinker of Mirandol. Uh, he said, um, if we plant vines, where will my cattle graze? Um, so he was very worried about his cows, which was his primary uh, passion at that time. Um, and eventually he relented and just before he passed away in 1999, he, he said to my dad and I, you know, go ahead and 
and plant some vines. Unfortunately, they never saw the saw the fruits of 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 the decision. Another anecdote is um, we've actually discovered 1800s, um, uh, and the reason I know that there's one is that there's mention made of it in the title deed um, of the Crendel, which dates back to 1720, um, in the in the movables of the farm. Um, but when my great grandfather bought the farm, there were no vines on the farm, and our theory is that the vines were wiped out by the phylloxera around 1870, um, and then. <laughs> I went to a doctor a year or three ago, a urologist, in fact, who lives um, on the edge of the farm, um, which actually used to be part of the farm, um, which was subsequently um, developed for, for housing. And he said to me, he remembers my grandfather riding around um, on the Crendel on horseback. And he also remembered um, finding a, an old vine in his garden, which he hadn't planted. And he was the first person to build a house on the specific plot. And so my conclusion is that it was the remnants of what had been on the farm all those years ago. Okay, so he was captured at Tobruk, my grandfather, and um, he escaped, tried to escape twice, caught both times. Uh, these are the stories he used to tell me on horseback. And um, he eventually got home after the war in 45 and met my dad for the first time. Um, Obviously, I'd sort of seen him as a baby, but my father certainly had no recollection of his father. Um, so it must have been quite a thing for my dad meeting his father at the age of five. And my, I said to my dad, what, what was it like meeting your father at that age? And he said, no, it was quite strange. And I said, well, what did you do? So he said, no, um, when I met my father, he asked me where my motor car was parked. So I took him by the hand and led him outside into the garage. Um, and there, under a tarpaulin, was, was the car that had been parked there for the last five years. So the only kind of connection that my father really felt with his father was this car parked outside in the garage. Um, so I thought that was quite a cute, cute story. Amazing. De Villiers, what is that story about, uh, is it your grandfather and Queen Elizabeth? Yeah, there's actually a nice photograph. Um, yeah, I'm going to share it. I don't know if you can find it. Can you see the pictures? Yeah, go forward. Yeah, go back one. Just go back one. I just want to mention that story about the sheep. There we go. Yeah. So, um, when my grandfather was in the when my grandfather was in the prison of war camp, um, he used to look through the fence and see these sheep grazing the field. Um, which he took a liking to, and they were uh, what was known as German mutton merino. And when he and he said to himself, when, while he was in the POW camp, if he ever got out of there alive, he wanted to import some of these sheep when he got home. And sure enough, in around forty six or forty seven, he imported these German merinos back to South Africa, and they're now known as South African mutton merino. And we've got about a thousand of them running around the Crenel uh, for many years. <laughs> They were actually known as takeaways because we didn't have a, a proper fencing and the residents from the, from, from the local township used to come in and help themselves. But now we've got a nice fence. So the takeaways are no longer takeaways. They said African mutton merino. Then if you go one slide forward um, to the picture that Gavin mentioned. Um, yeah, this is the, a photograph of my grandfather dancing with then Princess Elizabeth. Uh, this was on her 21st birthday in Cape Town in 47. And my grandfather was a... Kind of a, a budding politician and was asked to dance uh, with with the with the princess, the future queen. And as you can see, his hand on the back of the um, queen's uh, behind the queen's back is bare, um, which was completely uh, against protocol. You in those days and to this day, you're not meant to dance with royalty or touch royalty with your bare hands. And the story goes that my grandfather had forgotten his gloves at home. Um, <laughs> And it was actually quite f uh, funny that um, many, many years later, after the release of Mandela, and there was a royal visit to South Africa, it must have been 1996 or 97, um, my grandfather was invited to come and meet the Queen. I think it was at the uh, British Embassy in uh, Bishop's Court. And the Queen remembered my grandfather from all those years ago. Amazing. Looking back towards Cape Town of the, on the, of the Tigerberg Hill, uh, 
with the Rhinostobos, which is a highly endangered um, flora. Um, and we, um, you know, help conserve or protect. Um, also being me members of the uh, Biodiversity Wine Initiative. Um, those are the solar panels. There's Charles with his winemaking team. Uh, the gentleman Charles's right, our left, uh, is Morgan, and he is a came out of the winemakers guild protege program, and we've now appointed him. He did his protege program with us last year, and we've appointed him this year as an assistant winemaker. Let's see a picture of the cableway, um, and on the left is a photograph of the opening of the cableway in 1929. And my great grandmother Eileen is in the photograph, and uh, my great grandfather, in fact, was one of the first shareholders of or founders of the Cableway. And the shareholding was lost or sold at some point before the first or before the Second World War. And then about ten years ago, uh, BOE, um, who had a stake, decided to sell all their non-core interests. And so, as a family, we actually repurchased a small percentage in the Cableway. Um, for posterity, I should say you shouldn't do things for posterity, but it's turned out to be a, a very good investment up until now, of course. I don't have any questions. I just want to say that was absolutely outstanding. I can't wait to come and visit your place, seriously. Uh, I mean, just your homestead is magnificent and your wine is amazing, but the stories are what make it. So thank you so much for all your time. I don't think we've had somebody stay on for three sessions. <laughs> this is amazing. So thank you. Uh, De Villiers, yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much. I, I know that you came on for some of the sessions, but um, you know, after this, we're looking at doing uh, a tour with uh, the core of the people or those who want to be involved. And, Unfortunately, and we, we spoke about this yesterday or the day before, how Durbanville sort of gets missed when it comes to tours. Same as Constantia, and actually it's so close to the Cape, so close to Cape Town, and it's almost a travesty, because if you look at that view you've got, it's very hard to beat that view. If you look at all the stories around it, if you look at the quality of the wines, if you look at, um, I don't know, heritage, you look at... Um, all of the stuff, it should be a destination where more people are going to travel. And I, I, I mean, I do give people uh, tours and it's definitely a place I'm going to look at. Well, um, Harry, I really appre appreciate it. Thanks to Gavin as well for um, the opportunity to share some of our stories. Um, and you know, we would love to have any of you come visit and you, any of you can contact me directly um, with any questions and uh, please let me know when you when you do come, um, and, and um, I'll certainly come and say hi. Awesome, Harry. Yeah. Can I just can I just say because I've had the privilege of actually visiting your home, so we ran a fun run there a couple of well many years ago. It was um, a charity drive, and um, I got entrusted with carrying. Um, a large amount of water through your beautiful entrance hall. And I've never been so terrified in my life because they piled them up to my eyeballs. And I remember walking through this entrance hall and I had to go through to the kitchen and thinking, this is not a good time to drop anything, Rose. And then just another memory I have, because you were, you were mentioning the views, and I don't know anything really about gardens and architecture, but what I noticed were those archways and what happened in the garden when I was there was the, You've, you've managed to create these lovely um, archways with hedges and, and, and roses and they seem to just frame the view of, of the sea and Cape Town so beautifully and they sort of have these vistas which just they train your eye just to follow the view and I just wanted to comment on that because that was the one sort of memory that stands out for me. Um, for, for those of you that haven't been to the Crendel, um, and if you've got any guests that come from overseas uh, when the restaurants open again, to go and take, it's definitely that quintessential Table Mountain sunset. Uh, it's as good as it gets. So, uh, yeah, definitely food. looking forward. It is for, exquisite. Yeah, looking forward to going back. The food is outstanding. All, so, yeah, very excited. And it was lovely having you, Div. Nice seeing you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for inviting me.